What is meeting for worship? What is meeting for worship? Mm -hmm. You want to take that on, Frank? What is meeting for worship? I could, but uh, let's, can you, if you, only if you can't think of anything to say. We'll ask Frank to. Um, Meeting for Worship is an important opportunity to um, uh, remove yourself from the daily preoccupations and to ask yourself uh, uh, some questions about what you're doing and why, and uh, why is it important. In that sense, the queries are very helpful. Um, Right now, we're having a big discussion because we have rewritten the queries very recently. And some of the older members of our meeting have a big problem with the newly written queries. Mm -hmm. So, um, I guess we'll have to struggle that with that for a while. Can you elaborate on, you mentioned the notion of having to come to unity on something and be struggling for discernment. Right. Can you talk more about the center, the center, um, the nature of that in relation to Quakerism? Well, since friends do not believe that there is someone like a pope or a minister or someone in authority whose opinions matter more than anybody else's. That's not a part of Quakerism. We believe that in the search for guidance and truth, anyone, even a child, might say something that was uh, important and uh, brought the meeting to some recognition uh, on some issue. Um, so uh, it's a very... Uh, uh, Um, you know, our children in our meeting at Marion, their favorite is the George Fox song. It's my favorite, too. And I particularly like um, the verse that uh, says, Will you swear on the Bible? I will not, said he, for the truth is more holy than the book to me. Uh, so we are seeking for a kind of truth that might be useful to us now, not in some time in the past. How did you become involved in Quakerism? And what has kept you involved? Oh. Well, <clears throat> when I was about 15, I, uh, my, uh, my parents had... Uh, powerful role with me. My father was a Methodist minister. And he left the church because uh, it was in the midst of the Depression. And uh, he did not want to spend his time raising money for the church. He was uh, interested in social values and social justice. Those were very important to him. He had gone to um, school at um, uh, the uh, well-known socialist school in New York City, uh, training people to be ministers. Um, and um, though he uh, had a, a, a absorbed those ideas. Um, so he left the church. And when he left the church, he very, very almost never went back to church. And when I was about 15, I was reading the Bible and trying to uh, figure out where I wanted to be and how I wanted to try and get there. And I came upon my great-grandmother's diary. Uh, and in uh, one portion of it, she describes, she lived in Mount Gilead, Ohio. Um, and uh, a traveling minister came through. There was no such thing as not going to the evening meetings that he was having and causing them to all come up to the platform and confess their sins. So 
Oh, well, I should back up. She had been read out of Quaker meeting because of consorting with Methodist heathen, unquote. <laughs> but uh, apparently she retained a lot of Quaker ideas. So the, these evening meetings went on, evangelical, and finally the minister noticed that she had not come forward to confess her sins. Uh, and he said, Sister Wright, you haven't come forward. What she did was she stood up quietly and recited to him the second chapter of Corinthians. There was a great wind, and the Lord was not in the wind. There was a great fire, and the Lord was not in the fire. There was a still, small voice of calm, and there was to be found the Lord. And she sat down, and I thought, wow. I think I better look into this. So the Quaker meeting in Washington, D.C. was at Florida Avenue. And I went and uh, went to meeting there. And I thought, yeah, this is it. So in a way, I was converted by my great-grandmother, who was, of course, no longer living at the time that I read that diary. And what were your first impressions um, stepping into a Quaker meeting and uh, going for yourself? Well, I thought it was very valuable to uh, join with a group. I was, I also, at the same time, tried the Catholic religion. And uh, in that case, I had uh, a young Franciscan priest who was trying to teach me about being a Catholic. Um, you will see that I have a very pedantic mind because uh, at that time I was working in the um, uh, hospital, Walter Reed Hospital, and I was assigned to the uh, maternity part of the hospital, and I had seen babies being born. I had witnessed that. And so I said to him, Father Joe, do I have to believe that Mary was an intact physical virgin even after Jesus was born? He said, yes, it's a matter of faith. You have to accept that. I said, I'm sorry, I can't do it. I just can't do it. I mean, I had a rather pedantic mind. I had seen babies come down that particular road, and I knew that there was not going to be anything remotely resembling some intact piece of flesh that remained. And so uh, when I went to uh, the Quaker meeting, I, there was a secretary there at Florida Avenue meeting, and I asked him what he thought about the virgin birth and whether there was any requirement to believe such a thing. And of course, I think, I think we have to give credit to his enormous patience because he didn't laugh. He didn't say, oh my gosh, what have we got here? And remember, I was only 15 years old. I ask you, Jim, what do you think Marian Meeting would do with a 15-year-old without her parents who appeared and said she wanted to join the meeting? What would we do? I'm not sure. I, I can only hope that we uh, responded with the same courtesy we would with anyone, but I'm not sure we would. Knowing Marian Meeting as well as I do, I think we would be concerned to know what their parents thought. <laughs> And uh, uh, Florida Avenue meeting didn't respond that way. Mm. Um, they were content to come. And there was a member of the meeting named uh, Nicholson who decided that um, you couldn't be a Quaker just on the basis of the ideas. It had to be the relationships and the associations with people. And so she decided that I should go to West Town and she would, she would help me apply to go to West Town School because she said, otherwise you won't be able to remain a Quaker if you don't have a, a deep association with other Quakers. You, uh, it's, uh, it's not an individualistic religion. And she was, as far as I was concerned, she was right. So she did help me get 
to West Ham School. Well. Wow. So I guess really my part of that question was, what has kept you involved? What has kept me involved? All this time, and you sort of answered that. So, But I wonder, um, going forward into it, like, so we leave off, you've just joined uh, West Town uh, School. Um, I was a member of Florida Avenue Meeting when I went to West Town. Yeah. Florida Avenue Meeting, much to their credit, had accepted me. And they did send a visiting committee to go and meet. Uh, at my house and they did keep directing their questions to my father and my father kept saying I'm not planning to join she's planning to join ask her don't ask me and he kept <laughs> turning them off by their preference to speak to an adult which I think was understandable I mean they this committee of people were you know like in their 50s or 60s and they weren't used to trying to have a conversation with a 15-year-old. The secretary of Florida Avenue meeting was more interested in talking to me. Were there other younger friends like that when you were first getting interested in Quakerism? Uh, well, I went to a Catholic school for a while, and I had friends that are still my friends. Uh, their father was the director of organization at the AFL with after merger, the AFL-CIO, and I often, uh, my mother was not well at the time, I often spent time in that family of Catholics. Mm. So uh, you mentioned the AFL-CIO, and uh, I know that you've had a very active career uh, in the labor movement. Yes. <laughs> um, do you want to just like briefly touch on that, how you how you came to that, and maybe if some of your um, spiritual beliefs led you in any way towards some of your activism? Uh, well, I don't know how some of the members of Marian Meeting uh, would uh, respond, but uh, yes, and I think I speak for Franklin a little bit in this regard, too. The things that we think about equality and justice are not removed from what we think about Quakerism. The American Friends Service Committee, for instance, was a very, played a very important role. When I was at West Town, there was a weekend work camp that we used to go to in the slums of Philadelphia, where we would work with people, not trying to convert them, but work with them on trying to repair their house and fix it up. And in that, in that we would talk to them about what they thought and what their ideas were. We were encouraged to do that. Um, there's a recent uh, journal uh, of uh, the uh, uh, Friends Yearly Meeting, the Friends Journal, in which they talk about what is required to make peace in the world. Um, well, it, what is not required is to have a lot of definite ideas of your own about what would make peace and what wouldn't. That won't work. You have to uh, talk to people about where they are coming from, what their issues are, what their concerns are, what their feelings of injustice are. And that, almost every article in the recent issue of the Friends Journal talks about that. Talks about how Quakers, with well-meaning as we all were, would go and say, oh, well, we're going to teach you how to have peace and uh, you don't have to make judgments about other people. Well, I had an experience there which I think illustrates this. Um, Howard was invited to um, uh, teach a class at um, the university in uh, Israel. Um, and um, we went first with a tour from the University of Pennsylvania. And, um, uh, the woman who was leading the tour, 
uh, it was put on by the Hillel Foundation at the University of Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and uh, she told us that her husband was a reform rabbi and that he could not be a rabbi in Israel at that time could not be seen or recognized as a rabbi because he was reform. That's quite a shock to a group of Quakers. But you have to try to understand it if you're going to, you know. Instead of that, Quakers at Ramallah in, uh, uh, in Israel had a tendency to say, well, we accept everybody, and so we're not going to make these judgments. Uh, well, at that same tour, we um, uh, went, she took us to visit a family of Jewish refugees who had taken over a house and an orchard. And while we were there visiting that Jewish family, a Palestinian showed up and said, rather strongly, not hostily, more with resignation than anything, that that house and that orchard had been in his family for generations. And I remember, because I was not Jewish, I thought, doesn't anybody see the injustice here? This house and this orchard used to belong to his family. And now a group of Jewish refugees have come in and taken it over, and now they claim it as their own explains a lot about what's going on in Israel right now. But um, the mostly Jews who were in our group didn't see that, and uh, I think a lot of the Quakers at Ramallah didn't see that either. Because at the time, there was a lot of prejudice and feeling sorry for Jews. They had been murdered in Hitler's ovens, and so reaching out to the Jews and providing for them a place for them to be in Israel seemed to be the right thing to do. But nobody was thinking very hard about the people who had been there for generations, who were being asked to move over. Do you think um, lasting peace comes from seeing past uh, your in individual cultural biases? I certainly do. Yes, Jim, I do. I think you have to be <clears throat> willing to listen to other people. I'm finding a little hard to listen to Trump at the moment. But uh, I think if we were going to move forward as long as he's president, we would have to be trying not just to listen to him, but also to hopefully try to make him listen to us as well. I don't think it's a one-way path. I know that you were um, very active in the uh, civil rights movement for a time, and um, I know one of the tenets of the civil rights movement was to appeal for people to to the goodness in people and try and get them to see um, the reality of what was happening despite their own biases. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little bit about how you were led to participate in the movement that was happening at that time? Well, uh, when I was uh, I just graduated from college, I went to Earl College, uh, and um, when I was just graduated, I, the American Friends Service Committee sent me to a German work camp. Uh, that was pretty hard. Um, the young man who was the leader of the work camp uh, had been a member of the Hitler Youth. <laughs> that uh, took some doing on my part. But anyway, I then went to uh, Denmark <coughs> and uh, went to um, a, um, a uh, folk, folk high school which is a kind of adult education that they have in Scandinavian countries. By the way, everyone should read George Lakey's book, especially you, <laughs> if you haven't already done so. I have, it's wonderful, but it's great. Good. Uh, and um, I, um, 
uh, I, I met a young man named Moans Bittern. Uh, couldn't learn to pronounce his name to his satisfaction, so that relationship was going nowhere. But uh, he uh, invited me to an event that took place in uh, Denmark by the king decorating a man who had been the director of the archaeology exhibit in Denmark. And uh, who should show up but this Nazi admiral, all in stuff and feathers. At the time that this happened, the um, uh, British had been trying to forestall the invasion of England by the German Nazis. And uh, so this admiral shows up, all full of himself, with prims and buttons and so on, and he looks at the Viking ships, and he says to our hero, the manager of, of this museum, he says, you mean to say that men actually put to sea in these little ships? And he said, sir, those are the ships with which Denmark conquered England. For that remark, he spent the rest of the war in jail. Uh, the admiral was not pleased with that. <laughs> and when I was there uh, in the 1950s, um, the king had gotten around to decorating this man. And I remember saying, oh gee, that story illustrates exactly the major problem I would have. I would have thought of making that wonderful remark the next day or that night when it was no longer relevant. But this our hero said, right there on the spot to the man's face, sir, those are the ships with which Denmark conquered England. Uh, and I... Uh, uh, Mom, what if you were to uh, talk about your father and your mother and then how you came to join friends and become a convinced friend? I thought I did. No, I, we didn't really get to that in any detail. Well, I did go to Florida Avenue meeting and I asked if I could join and I did describe their coming to interview me and meeting my parents and my father refusing to say. Now, my father's response was kind of interesting. His grandmother, after all, was a Quaker, read right out of meeting. Uh, so Quakerism was not a strange idea to him. But he was very clear, even though I was 15 years old, that if I was going to do it, it should be off my own ideas. That he, was, he wanted to make it clear to the visiting group of friends that he was playing no role in it at all. I think, therefore, I would have to say that my upbringing was pretty unusual and that my parents were not uh, trying to uh, tell me what I should or shouldn't do with regard to religion. Yes. Um, I think we, we should return to, you know, we can return back to subjects, you know, as we continue this process. I would like to... Uh, return at this point to, uh, you were in station, you had gone to Germany, um, and, uh, I suppose, like, so you got to this question through, uh, how did you end up getting into the movement for civil rights in America? Um, so you're in Germany now, uh, what's happening and what leads you back home to, uh, the activism that you end up doing here? <coughs> well, uh, uh, my, uh, my husband, whom I had met at West Town at that point, was, uh, uh, we, we went to spend a year in Europe, and he, at the end of the year, was going to take up graduate school, uh, uh, studying uh, psychology and, and philosophy. And so we went back to 
Champaign-Urbana, and uh, there I was active in that Quaker meeting in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. Um, I think I was a pretty committed Quaker at that point. Um, the American Friends Service Committee had sent me to the work camp in Germany, but the work camp itself was a German work camp. It was not run by Quakers, and uh, it was uh, a pretty severe challenge to, uh, uh, you know, the ex-Nazi who was running the camp had not completely separated himself from Nazism uh, in, in the way in which he was conducting himself. You know, so it was uh, it it was a challenge to uh, work with them, um, but we did. Yeah, I think it's there's an interesting um, different scenarios, but there's an interesting um, pervasiveness about the culture of militarism and uh, and uh, bigotry in Germany at the time because conscription into the Hitler Youth was mandatory, right? Mm -hmm. and, it, and it pervaded all of Germany at the time, um, you know, and wherever they went. There and were Quakers in Germany, however, and they did have a hard time. They operated a home, uh, a house for people who were trying to escape, for instance, and somehow they got away with it. I mean, they weren't putting Quakers in concentration camps, but they were um, um, blocking on the name of the famous minister in Germany who said, uh, first they came the Jews, for the Jews I wasn't Jewish, so uh, I didn't say anything. Then they came for the gypsies, I wasn't a gypsy, so, they, so I didn't say anything. And when they came for me, there was no one left to speak for me. Uh, he was he was killed. He was uh, murdered for that particular point of view. I remember a, a vocal ministry that you said once in a meeting about. Um, I think it was a minister who you had somehow met, maybe, uh, who was responsible for um, uh, getting a lot of people out of. Nazi Germany and saving mm -hmm. some lives at the time. Does yeah, that ring well, any bells? Well, no, it was a Quaker, yes. It was a Quaker. Yes, I mean, that's... That, that, I always uh, am required that people take their religion with a sense of humor because... Um, uh, let me back up a minute and I'll come back to this. One of my favorite stories about William Penn. I think I may have told you this story about William Penn, did I? Oh, well, let's hear it. Uh, he... Uh, um, a group of uh, Dutch settlers came and said they thought they had a witch. This is at the time that the Puritans were busy burning witches at the stake and all. And uh, they wanted to have a trial because this witch was causing their animals to die. And uh, uh, so he said, all right, they could have a trial, but he would uh, preside over it. Uh, and he says to the woman who's accused of being a witch, Art thou a witch? Well, she gets pretty upset, naturally. She doesn't want to burn a stake. She says, Ask my daughter. I don't know. What, how can I answer that question? <laughs> and he says, Well, dost thou ride on a broomstick? Not that there's any law against it. I fell in love all over with William Penn. He had a sense of humor. I think... To have a sense of humor is important because it's important not to take ourselves too seriously. You know, none of us have all the answers. And to the extent that we think we have an answer, we better be ready with other people to uh, look at it with some sense of humor and detachment. So that, uh, that made me feel very good. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only that, but William Penn st studied the Lenape language while he was still in England. And uh, he um, uh, went, when he got here, he went to meet with the Lenape. And he's, this is an important part of Quakerism to me. But it has its other side too. But uh, he said, he discovered that the Lenape believed in the Great Spirit. 
as do we. Why do we need to try to convert them? So as far as I know, almost no Quaker has ever tried to convert a group of Indians to being Quakers. Um, uh, whereas most other religions, that is something that's sort of unique about Quakers. You know, when the Spanish uh, priests arrived here, the first thing they thought was important to do was to make Catholics out of the Indians, right? <laughs> 